So Anthony, with that, why don't you introduce yourself uh, and let's kick off the show? Because right. this will be recorded well, and posted right. later. <laughs> yeah, we'll post it later. Um, Anthony Angelillo, branch manager at Paramount Residential Mortgage Group, uh, CEO, founder of Tag Team Nation. I'm not going to go into my bio. So I got you, uh, Neil. <laughs> uh, basically, um, what we do is we basically close every single loan for all of you wonderful real estate agents. So thank you for the compliment, Neil. I appreciate that. I am one persistent, you know what, uh, and I don't give up and I, 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 I pride myself in that. But that being said, uh, 17 years in the business and I told Neil my story. Uh, the story was 10 years ago, I was doing lead optimization that uh, basically started uh, many branches that uh, I was a branch manager at. And it was an old model. Uh, and it, I, I thought at the time it was a dying model. Uh, and now what we've implemented is something that is more user friendly, technology automated, uh, and it's allowed to basically catapult my lending career in a different, uh, different a different world that I have never even meant even to dream about. And I can tell you guys that automation uh, is amazing. And uh, we were just talking about this prior to us going live or attempting to go live, uh, but it's changed the way we've done business. And now with COVID and all of that, uh, that's just truly something that is a blessing that we've already implemented that stuff. So that being said, um, I will hand it off to Melinda. It, it is a blessing to have her on this uh, show. Last show was amazing. It was great, but we felt a little bit naked without her. So kudos to Melinda uh, on her vacation. Thank you. It's <laughs> nice, nice to be back. I had to take five days off with the kids. It was my son's birthday. We had a nice time. Um, definitely was having a little FOMO, but we needed it as a family to just have some downtime. So good to be back, back in action now and uh, in full swing. So I'm Melinda Grimaldi, real estate and title attorney with Grimaldi Law Firm and co-host of Damage Control. What, what episode are we on, Anthony? 23. 23. This has been the cool thing. I really am enjoying this. It's allowed us to share and we, we learn a lot just from these calls as well. So from our guests, from each other, we're constantly exchanging business tips and strategies and business planning. So uh, we hope that you guys, whether you're watching live or afterwards, uh, feel the same way. We've gotten such great feedback so far. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce Neil. Everyone knows what damage control is about. We help you either close your loans, close your deals, um, or help you with your marketing, your business strategies, whatever it is with, a, with, a, with an eye on the real estate industry, of course. Neil is... Uh, I met him a few years ago. We, we keep uh, bumping into each other, even a random, uh, a random Dunkin' Donuts. I caught him one day working in the corner. Um, he's a dad, a husband, a broker, Mr. Bowtie, as I like to call him, because, you know, he sports his bowtie all the time. It's a great little trademark he got going on there. Um, so I'll let him, you know, uh, give a little bit about what, what he's doing. But today's topic he gave us a list of things that he would talk about, and this one just seems so interesting to us. Even the idea like that, that, that he would just bring it up in, 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 as an option in the way he described it. The profitability of influence. It's more social than media. I love that. I love that. So love thank that. you so much, Neil, for, for joining us. And, uh, you know, let us, you know, I don't know how much you want to share, but we can just get straight into it. I know you said you're not in for big intro, so let's just get into it. Um, and let's talk about why you suggested this topic. First. So first of all, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, everyone, for being on and allowing me in your homes. I bet you didn't know that I was going to be in your house or your car, wherever you are right now today. Um, but Neil Oates Jr., you guys can find me, find whatever you want to about me um, on social media, online. Uh, I was talking to Melinda and Anthony before everyone joined, and I was like, you guys asked for my bio, but I hope you're not going to read it, because the reality is, unless everyone, until everyone knows that I can give them something, they don't really care who I am, right? And, and not in a bad way. That, that, that doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a human being. Because the reality is you don't care about me or no care who I am until you know there's a benefit and a reason for you to listen and to stay tuned in. Um, because here's another reality. Those uh, um, viewers of Damage Control, they're here because they know that they're getting something from it. As much as they love Anthony and Melinda, there has to be a benefit in it. Uh, and and the, the reason I came up with the idea or I offered 
um, the, the idea of the profitability of influence uh, and it, it's more social than media is because what I see right now, there are a lot of agents who are just confused. You know, I mean, as a trainer for the for NAR, for Florida Realtors, or and a, a licensed instructor here in Florida, a lot of people are just curious. They're, they're, they don't know what's going on. Well, how can I maximize my impact? How can I maximize, um, you know, the, the reach that I have? And how can I make more money? Uh, and, and I think that the idea is, that you have to do something extravagant, that, that you have to do something that's way outside of the box. Well, when say people say think outside of the box, it doesn't matter if you're a mile outside of the box or a centimeter, right? You just have to do something different and better than everyone else is doing. Uh, and fortunately for me, I've been fortunate enough to do that for many, many years now. Um, after being in this industry for 15 years and having um, my own brokerage, uh, I, I think that the way we're operating, the way we think, um, and, and, and it's not just me. I want to make that clear. It's not just me. It's because I get coaching from some of the best coaches in the country, if not the world. Uh, and then I have colleagues who are sharing ideas, who are helping us uh, say, okay, how can you take the influence that you have and how can you maximize the impact and therefore make it more profitable? I'm going to park coaching over there for a little bit because I'm going to go back to that and I made a note of it and I'm taking notes from what you're saying already. Um, the good little nuggets. So, but let, let, so, you know, it's more social than media. How'd you do that? Yeah. I want to know about that. Where, where does that come from? Why, why is that part of the title? Let's talk about that. Because when people think of influence and, and this is a gift and a curse for us and our times right now, um, we think that media has been around forever, right? We think that, you know, and, and I don't want anyone to age themselves, but there was a time before a smartphone. There was a time when the idea of a camera, remember we had to say the word camera before phone if you had a camera phone, right? Um, but what has always been the case, uh, the, the social aspect of influence has been around before the written word. It has been around visual, before visual com uh, communication. It has been around before spoken word. The social aspect of it where because of our proximity or because of the grunts that we made, um, it, it was there. And I think, not, not I think, it has been evidenced uh, that for us, we tend to forget about the social aspect of business. Um, I know Anthony was talking uh, before uh, everyone joined about cranking things out in an older model um, and, and how he was doing it. Uh, but I think now we do need to look at the social part of influence uh, and not say, because when it says social media, everyone thinks social media, social media, that means I need to tag more, post more, I need more followers. Um, but how social are you in your social media? How social, how much do you socialize? How, how much impact, how much engagement and relationships are you putting uh, in there? Go ahead, Melinda. No, but that, that's so important because you could have a million followers, but if you're not having that, you have to pull the follower out of social media and bring it into real life is what I, how, whenever I do my workshops about marketing is how do you pull that? into real life, like bring them out. So you use so, that, right, to bring them out. Get them out of this. That's the same thing. So our idea, and now understand when I say offline, right? So, so be careful. I'm not saying that we're just gonna go out and uh, be, you know, disregard all of the, the guidelines that we have in the pandemic. But the, 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 the entire purpose and the function when social media began was to make online connections to build offline relationships, to make online connections to build offline relationships or to strengthen offline relationships via online connections. Awesome. Now, unfortunately, awesome. Say that one more time. I know, I know. I'm writing that oh. one down. <laughs> So, so the idea was to use online connections to build offline relationships. Th that was the idea. Or vice versa. If you had an offline relationship, you wanted to strengthen your online connection. Um, 
the mistake that we've made and what we see right now is we have online connections and we're trying to build online relationships, you know, but, but there, there's no connection there. Uh, we want to communicate, we want to talk, but we don't want to connect. Um, and, and I think that's a dangerous place for us to be, especially in business. Um, right now, oh, I'm sorry. If you don't stop me, Melinda, I'm just going to- No, go. Going. I was just taking a deep breath, but go ahead. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> I wasn't trying to interrupt, but don't worry. Go ahead. I want to bring it to our industry right now. Uh, in this pandemic, and people are saying, well, how can we you know, do business? How can we be successful? It's the same thing. Um, you know, use the influence you have to take your online connections and build offline relationships. Uh, and, you know, the profitability of influence. I'm going to start with what is influence. I think that that's the, 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 the foundation. Um, to be an influencer does not mean that you have to have tons of followers. It just means that people have to listen or care and value your position, your impact, your, your voice. Um, and, and if not, if you aren't being, if you're not having the impact or the influence that you're having, it simply means, and this is not on you as a person, it just means that who, your audience does not value whatever you're trying to contribute, right? So if I'm a real estate agent, and if I don't have clients who are coming to me, who don't trust me, a lot of people want to say it's exposure. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. But I believe that whatever you're offering, whatever you're trying to contribute to the real estate marketplace doesn't have any value. Because what we do know is that where people perceive value, that's where they'll take their money, right? Even in, even in this pandemic, where people perceive there's value, that people are still spending money right now yeah. that have been furloughed because they see a value in it. There are mm -hmm. agents right now who are thriving, not surviving or, or barely getting by, right? There are agents who are making it. Why? Because people see value and therefore they have influence on their decision making. And not that they're going all social media. It, the majority of the time it goes back to where there's some social proof. Um, so I do want, if you want to take a note, so look at social media. You know, we talked about the, the, the social and the offline and online, but social proof is going to be one of the fastest ways uh, and, and really the most genuine way to, to increase your influence on social media or just in, in general. And social proof is just having someone else. You know, we always talk about testimonials, testimonials right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if Anthony says it about himself, he is a cocky, egotistical, you know, just rude dude, right? But if Robert says it about Anthony, oh, well, that's a testimony. Right? And so I think that one of the greatest social proofs we have right now um, are, is just a testimonial video, right? Are you asking your client? Because right now, everyone, think about this. We as agents and as buyers and sellers or just individuals, we used to hate the way we looked on, on video. We used to hate the way we sounded. But guess what? We've come to the terms. Even if you hate the way you look and sound, you've come to the terms that you're going to have to get out, get out of your comfort zone. So I think now is one of the best times and easiest times to leverage your influence by saying, if you had a great time, if you had a great experience, would you mind just saying that as I'm recording you on Zoom? We don't even have to ask them to record it on their phone and send it to us. So like now you get on and then it's on us to edit the video so that it's one box instead of two or five or whatever it is, have their title on the bottom. Uh, and, and I think, when we have one video testimonial, because if a picture is worth a thousand words, I think a video is worth a, at least a thousand dollars, right? Um, right. And, and so then we start doing that and we can leverage that. And so this goes back to the influence that we have. Now we become more profitable because instead of you showing, and I, once again, I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings or question what you guys are doing. I just know what my coaches and the, the experience that I've had and the results that I've seen from it. Instead of you showing me another one of your properties or a three minute long video of one of your properties, if you showed me a 30 second clip of two of your clients talking about how awesome you are, the influence that would have, and that would make you more profitable than you showing me another one of your list all day, every day. I love it. How would you do that as a, as an agent? What, what would be your technique to ask? I, I feel like a lot of agents are scared to ask for referrals and when's what? the best time? They, they should be, we, I'm going to say we, because I want to be inclusive. <laughs> we. we should, we should be scared to ask for referrals because we have not delivered the, the quality of service that we're supposed to, 
right? Uh, and so I'm, I'm a believer um, in, in what um, I believe it was either, it was either Oprah, I, I believe it was Oprah that says it, said that when you believe in a product, you push it and you push it hard, right? So if you don't believe in, the, in your service and in yourself and the quality of the service that you provide, you should be afraid to ask for a referral, right? Because if you're not confident, I'm going to feel your lack of enthusiasm. What I would say, I would say, don't ask for referrals, earn them. So my, my mentor uh, many years ago said, Neil, you don't ask for referrals, you earn them. And so I believe that the best time to ask or to set that expectation is during the initial consultation, either the marketing consultation or the buyer consultation. Hey, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask for your open, honest feedback so that I can provide you the best service ever. And throughout this process, if I'm going to ask you, how are you enjoying it so far? What can I improve on? So I'm not going to ask for a referral at the end. I'm going to ask for at the beginning okay. because I want to begin with the end in mind. I want to say, hey, and just so you know, um, Marilyn, if you love the service, by the end of this transaction, as we go through the home uh, viewing process, the negotiation, uh, as we go, th because I'm going to outline what I'm going to do and I'm building value at every point. So as we go through showing the inspection, you know, the contingencies, the escrow, as we're going through that process, if you think of anyone who could use my services, please let me know. And more valuable than just the referral itself would be your testimony. Because what I know, Marilyn, is that your words are going to be, are going to ring so loudly into the ears of someone who's looking just like yourself. Would you be willing to do that? Uh, and then they might say no. So, you know, I'll ask you later. But the reason I'm comfortable setting that expectation, not only to ask for a referral, but also for a testimonial, is because I believe in the service that I'm going to provide. Um, if I don't, and, and a lot of people, you know, hesitate because they haven't set that expectation up front. Um, but when you believe in the service and then you start executing what you say you're going to um, and delivering what you say you're going to, then I think they're saying, okay, well, you know, Neil mentioned showing properties, negotiating, offer, inspection. Then he says something else. Oh, yeah, he did mention testimonial. Okay, well, we're going to skip that. Then he mentioned escrow. Then he mentioned, you know, closing date. Then he mentioned referral and testimonial. So I guess I should get to the referral because I've held up my end of the bargain, right? Um, and then influence. The, the, the more influential you want to be, the more credible you have to be in delivering uh, what it is you say you're going to do. Wow. I love that. In my coaching program, too, um, they suggested that I have a money-back guarantee, like I'm so like for me, I talk to agents, right? So I tell the agents, I'm so certain your client will be happy that we won't charge them a settlement fee at closing if they're not happy by the end. So now that's part of my pitch. And I'm very confident about that. And I've been using it for two years and no one has asked for it uh, at the end because, you know, we work really hard to make the process as smooth as possible. So, but I feel confident in that. And, and, and if you don't, and if you're, if, if you're there as an agent, don't feel comfortable asking for testimony, then you need to reflect on that, I think, and say, what could I do better? And start reflecting on your services or your education or your team or where you can get the support to make yourself feel more confident. Like, where is that lack of confidence coming from? And self-reflection is important, right? Dana said, look within. <laughs> Melinda, on that right there, so I can't do this in the real estate side because of making sure that we know, they know what they're uh, going to be paying for compensation right. uh, and everything. That's a different conversation. But on the teaching side, and, and I want you all to use this, or use this idea um, so as an instructor, when I go into offices or brokerages um, or even state associations, I'm telling them that I'm teaching for tips. Um, and, and so I want you to think about how different the quality of your service would be if you adopted this mentality. What if you sold real estate for tips? What if you did, you know, title or lending for tips, meaning that I'm coming in and the tip, we're, we're not putting in that, that mandatory the tip right now is zero. I've earned zero because in essence, in the real estate business, until they close, how much have we earned? Zero, right? And so my idea, and so what I told uh, many of the associations is that, you know, I'm teaching for tips for the rest of 2020, which means that when you do a speaker agreement, it's zero. We're going to base how much you pay me. You, you can decide to pay me a dollar, zero, 10,000, whatever you want to, but that's going to be based on the value that you and your members receive from me. 
Why do I do that? Because I know that when I get in front of their people, it's going to be valuable. So what if you went into every buyer consultation, every marketing uh, consultation with the idea, not that we can because we have to disclose the, the compensation, um, but with the idea of if I don't give them world-class, world-renowned service, I really could look at getting zero. Because what I've found is, is that if, even if you get, and we're going to say coconuts, if you get two coconuts or three coconuts at the end of the transaction, but then they go back and say that it was the worst experience they've had, you've really lost, right? Um, so, so that's an idea where, where I would challenge everyone, focus on the service, um, and then as the service and the quality of the service that, we, that, that you deliver, as that increases, your influence increases, your profitability increases. Um, many of us, I think that the, one of the greatest detriments to us and our success is that we think that we're in the real estate business serving people, right? Um, we're not in the real estate business. We're in the people business and we just sell real estate, yes. right? And, and, and that, that goes back to the social aspect of it. Um, so I think that once we grasp the idea of without, because without people, we could have access to all of the real estate in the entire country and we would be, and, and it wouldn't do us any good. Right. Um, so I, I would just challenge everyone to look at it as we're in a people business and then we sell real estate instead of real estate. And then we're servicing people. I love that. And bringing on that, the, the next book on my shelf is like the, the Ritz Carlton book. Have you, has anyone ever read that one? Have you read that one, Neil? Yep. I'm yep. sure you're well read. I know I, I figured you would have read that one. Um, Anthony, have you heard of that book? It's like yeah. the Ritz, I forget the Ritz Carlton effect, the Ritz Carlton. I have it on my bookshelf. Actually, it's digital, but that's one that uh, I've been meaning to read. So that's, that's next up, which talks about the service and how may I serve you type of thing. And uh, I think that's a really important so, thing so that we need to remember. Right there. And I know we were talking about service a lot, but when we talk about influence, what I'm going to challenge us to do right now, great service is not enough anymore, right? Because, and, and here's what I want us to think about. McDonald's. And I know we're not going and dining in at McDonald's anymore, but you know, they have the, the, the personal kiosk where you can serve yourself. I want us to think about service. There was a time when you would have to wait in line at McDonald's for to them to call out your number. But now, even at McDonald's, when you order a meal, you can go sit down and they will bring your food to your table, right? So, so just think about that. So service alone now is not enough. Now we have to increase our influence, increase our um, personalities and, and our perception by offering an outstanding experience. So I want you all to, and so that's what Ritz Carlton does. It's not just the service, it's the experience that they provide as well. So if we're in this real estate industry, how can you not only provide outstanding service, but how can you create an outstanding experience? One that they'd be like, well, yeah, you know, I, I bought a property and, and, and I, or I sold and I did a transaction with them but the experience was one that I can't believe. Let me tell you what uh, so-and-so did during this transaction. How did they make this experience fantastic? Um, and, and I mean, there, we can get creative, especially doing things on video and virtual right now, uh, but not only look at the service, but also look at the experience that we create and how can we make that unique and tailored to us. I think a big thing about someone's experience is also setting up the right expectations of what the experience is going to look like. Cause a lot of people don't know what it's going to be happening or they're, they're waiting, you know, morning of closing day with their, with their moving truck, everything packed up, waiting to go into the house. And it's not always that smooth, <laughs> but if you tell them that in advance about what to expect, and everyone should be doing that. The lender, the, 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 the realtor, title, we should all be setting up the right expectations so that they're not disappointed when things don't always go exactly as planned. And that's part of the business, but they don't want to hear that's part of the business. That's kind of, you know, it, it's very common for funding to be the next day or it's very, they, if they, you tell them in the beginning versus in the moment, the experience changes as what, how they interact with that scenario. Now, Melinda, see, you're, you're making a common assumption that we as real estate agents know the process, right? <laughs> and, and I know some of my, my, my colleagues and peers are going to be like, Neil, how dare you say that to us? Um, but that requires us to go deeper and to know more about the process and not be afraid of closing day. I have 
you know, I talk to so many of us, myself, like us, this is family talk right now, guys. So many of us who are afraid to go to a closing because we don't know what's going to happen, right? Um, when I, but that's when you can increase, that's when you can improve the experience for our clients, customers, um, when we're there, letting them know, hey, you're right, it, some stuff could go wrong, um, but I'm going to be here. And, and there are all, now, I do want to make this disclaimer, there are all different, you know, schools of thought. Well, no, I'll have someone else. That's not my job. It's my job to go out and prospect. It's my job to do this. All I'm going to say to you is that when we start talking about influence and profitability, or if, now it's your business, you run your business how you want to. I know that what has worked for some of the most successful agents in the country is making sure that they focus on that social, that relational aspect, not looking at it as a transaction, not saying, okay, because in my mind, if you can time block for prospecting, if you can time block for consultations and you can't time block for a closing to be there in person, I'm, I'm challenging some of you, right? Then that lets me know that you're not willing to take your business to the next level because in that moment when there's a little bit of friction, that's when you're really going to see. That could be the difference maker in the entire experience. Like, what have you done for me lately? What did you do for me on closing day when things got kind of rocky? Uh, did you say, well, you know what? I'm out showing right now, or I'm at a consultation, or did you not even respond to me? Did you say, you know, I, I let me call the lender and find out, or did you pick up the phone and let me know that things are going to be okay? Um, so j just my two cents, you guys can yeah. take that two cents and put it in the bank or put it in the trash. Up to you. I, I think it definitely like helps close the deal. Like it make everyone feel like, yes, we, we achieved it together. I think clients like it from my perspective. I think clients like it when their agents are at closing most of the time. All, ag goes all agents should be at closings. I mean, that's yeah. like, that's school of thought. I mean, that's my, my biggest pet peeve, Neil <clears throat> is, and you, and you said it is the experience and Melinda elaborated on expectations, you build a foundation with that real estate agent. You know his or her idiosyncrasies. You know how they operate. What happens when someone doesn't use that agent and they're using someone else? Meaning if they're getting pre-approved with a different lender that doesn't know the system or is brand new to the business, I feel like that's where breakdown happens. That's where lack of communication happens because uh, either they're not structured or organized and that's the most difficult part of trying to set that experience. Yeah, if you don't know who you're dealing with, it's hard to set up those expectations. Normally it goes like this, but yeah. I, don't, I don't know how it's going to go this time. <laughs> Neil, Neil you, said, you said that social proof is one of the biggest ways to increase your influence. Do you have any other suggestions other than the videos and testimonials? So one of the greatest things that any of us can do is to be perceived as an expert in whatever it is that we do. Uh, and the, it has not changed in, since time began. The, the person who is perceived as an expert is the one who has the voice. Um, and, and to have the voice for us is easier than ever for us to have the voice. And what I mean by the voice is if you're in a room, you, you, you know who the leader is in the room because when they speak, people listen. And, and I'm not only talking about a verbal voice, I'm also talking about in written. So if you all are not writing or submitting articles to, to publications and to news publications, to blogs, uh, I encourage you to do that immediately. Um, and so part of the reason why I'm known for anything is because I just took the time, I, I started knowing the the key metrics in real estate, right? And then once I would find out what's happening in real estate, I would just share those metrics with the Miami Herald, the Sun Sentinel. Now, could they get it themselves? Absolutely. Were there people who were more knowledgeable than me? Yes, but what was I doing? I was just doing little articles, little bylines and sending them in every week, every week, just with my point of view, my perspective. Uh, and here's what I find out and here's what is easier because I was doing this 14 years ago. If you all look, if you go to any major publication to their website and go to contact us, you're going to get the emails for almost every one of their editors, every one of their reporters, because they need content. And for, so, so here's like Noel and Robert, they could give the same content, exact same content, but then 
because of, and here's the reality, because of the aesthetics. So, or let's say Neil and Noel, if we give the same content, right, they will choose Noel this week because it makes their paper or their, um, the, the publication more diverse than it would if it was me this week, depending on the types of articles that they're running and the news that's involved. Right. And then because they want to have the byline and the photos. So and here, here's the reality. Uh, about a month and a half ago, when I was sending out articles and bylines, my photo was in almost every publication because we have to know what's happening on the social side of it. And then we have to use that to our advantage. Right. So I was getting a lot of press because, yes, I was giving market information, much that my, many of my colleagues were giving the same information, but it was just I was a good photo and a good frame for the publications. You guys got me. So I'm not going to go any, de any deeper than that. Just, just, just yeah. that. Uh, and, and so that's one thing. So go into every publication. Uh, and if you all have not, and I'm not going to plug them because I support them. It's just I think it's the easiest way for an agent to get into any type of publication. Miami Agent Magazine, right? Uh, if you all are in South Florida, MiamiAgentMagazine.com, you can go in and you can be a source for them. You can go on and give your viewpoints. You, and you can do everything electronically where you submit the subject that you want to talk about, send it in, and it's a very high likelihood that you will be included. So um, what is it, a forum, Neil? It's just a forum that you put your information and, and submit it? So, so they have three forms and then you send in your photo and what is Miami agent magazine. And, and here's what's so amazing because everything is digital for them. But once it's online, what do I get? Because the public, they don't know any different, right? We are, many of us probably get emails from Miami agent magazine, right? Well, we're probably on their list. But what you don't know is that if you go to the home page and in the middle section, it's going to be be a guest contributor, give your viewpoints or what area do you specialize in? So what I was doing, I was just sending, you know, I've just sat down one day and made it my Miami agent magazine day. And I went and I just shot so much information where they had to choose me because they were like, this dude right here isn't going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what happens then is now I'm perceived as an expert because I'm talking about luxury real estate. I'm talking about global real estate. I'm talking about single family homes here in South Florida. I'm using my viewpoints to talk about what I think is going to happen when, when it comes to gentrification. And is it great content for them? Yes. Did they have to do anything to get the information? No, it makes their job easier. And now they can have a weekly publication uh, and then, I'm taking those links because digital doesn't die. I'm taking those links. I'm getting that content. I'm creating it in a printed format for my marketing books. I'm doing the same yeah. thing when it goes and I'm putting it on links to my stuff because now I am the voice. If I'm on Miami Herald, Sun Sentinel, uh, Florida Realtors, NAR, um, you know, those types of things. Now, when I'm out in public and I share that with, and if you, all, if you all look for me, it will be almost impossible for you to find any type of my property marketing um, uh, with the exception of maybe one or two where the seller was just hard pressed. It was a high dollar property and wanted some marketing. Most of it is social proof marketing where people will say, okay, well, I want to hire him or work with him because of his position. He's seen as an expert in these different niches. Uh, and, and so if we do that, it's never been easy. It's just that we aren't, like, we aren't, we aren't being told, we aren't being saying, okay, hey, market yourself, brand yourself, let people know what your expertise is, because there's not as much money in that for the other side. It's easier for the other side to say, all right, um, let me get them to put all this dollar, all these dollars in this big budget into um, marketing properties. Right, because properties, for us, all we have to do is upload photos. For us to market ourselves, we have to start thinking, how do I want to be perceived? What's the image that I want to create? I have to sit down and type out words, and we hate writing. Like, even in the contract, we just want to fill in blank. Right? So, so that, that, that's some, those are some of the things that, uh, and, and they're all free. With the exception of the time they're putting, they're all free. And, and you know what it is, too, I think a little bit, at least for some, is that people don't want to be judged by what they put out. They're going to be judged anyway, though. 
Yes. But like, well, if I put this article out or if I put this commentary or, you know, my social proof, like what are, you know, they don't even feel confident in their own contributions because I, I, and you know what, I'm probably a judge, a a perfect example, because there's actually, I've been told to do this so many times. And yeah, I have a lot of things to do, but I could, I could have very easily done this or have my, my staff help me do this, you know, but I haven't done it yet. So now I have an idea of what to do and it's coming. So, so my, Thank you, my, my thing is, <laughs> there are always going to be critics. There are always going to be people who are going to belittle. So I, for instance, I did a post on social media. I, I believe it was my, it, 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 it had to be Instagram. No, it was, this one was Facebook. It said, what problem can I help you solve, right? Because I want to add value to my community. What problem can I help you solve? There were one or two people who were like, hey, you know, my nonprofit is looking for a warehouse space um, that can be donated so we can do a pop-up, um, you know, shop where people, a pop-up shop, but for giveaways, right? We just need warehouse space where we can socially distance, have people come in. And so immediately I start connecting people, trying to get that worked out and figured out. Uh, one agent up in Central Florida, hey, Neil, I need more listings. Let's talk tomorrow to see how we can, you know, look at getting you more listings. And then the cynics. Right. And, and, and those people who are critical they start coming in. Start, can you help me? Can you help me solve Z divided by X, Y, this, 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 and this. And so then to me, so I, for them to see the post, be able to comment, we have to be friends on social media, right? On Facebook or the IG, whatever it is. And so then I was like, hey, your smart comment just got you removed from my list. I don't have time to play, you know, with, with you being cynical or critical. That's not why I'm here. Delete. The guy called me, we're, we're, we're friends. He called me, Neil, I can't believe you would do this. I said, hey, understand you can do whatever you want, but for me, my social media is my living room, right? So if I wouldn't have you in my house or feel comfortable around my family in the living room, I'm not gonna have you in my social media. Now, that, that's just me. So that's why I don't have a 10,000, 15,000 people follower um, following but then it goes back to, you know, how many people do we really need to have to, to be an influencer, right? If I have fantastic influence in my database, I have about 270 people in my CRM. Um, but the, the, the value that I give to that 270 is such that when they get an email from me, my open rate is about 90 something percent, Wow! right? Wow. And, and so I've gone through and, and I'm not trying to hit 3,000, 7,500. Like if I can have 270 people, if when I send them an email and they say, okay, I open it, I clicked on it, uh, I got this information, then I've won. Because what I do know is that when I send a video, when I share something with them, they're going to share it if, if it's a value to their circle, to their sphere. I just, need it. I just need my business and my life and my influence to be to the point where if I call you or if I send you a text, you're either going to pick up the phone or you're going to respond to it. That's my idea of influence, right? And, and so I know that's totally adverse to many others, but I also believe that it's because of the consistency and me communicating what my expectation of our relationship and our interaction is going to be. I, and I think it also, like, like you said, we're in a relationship business. I think that's because we're in a relationship business, our influence and a strong influence is going to look different than someone who's selling tchotchkes on social media, right? Because like, that's a totally different type of influence that you need. And you need like thousands of people to see it. And there's a certain percentage of people that are going to buy it versus no one's going to hire a real estate agent that very unlikely. I mean, it happens, but without that, some sort of social proof or relationship or recommendation from someone that they have a relationship with. So that's, that's, that's the importance of having that, like knowing what type of influence you need because there's different types i think Neil, right. did you uh did you have more followers and then you you deep you basically eliminated you deleted all of the you got quality over qual- quantity is that what you did or so so I, it, it, I didn't it, do that i'm, I'm just curious because I, I i think that's a great great way of approaching it just really condensing it into you know your your sphere your influence and, and really targeting and, and producing amazing quality for those people that are always constantly sending you business, vice versa. Is that what you did? Now, now in my CRM, it has, it has gone up and down. 
right? Because my CRM, the way it's working, I'm not uh, one that is afraid. I just know I saw the purge, right? So, so I, I like the idea of the purge. <laughs> so I'm always going through. And if I'm seeing uh, where it's either not being open or if I, I, I'm just not that guy, I, I know I get too much junk in my email or via phone call and already, right? So if, you, if, you, if we're here and if we're good and if we're locked in, good. Um, if not, then by all means, go forth, right? Be, be gone. Uh, so, so the CRM, yes, I have purged it that way. I've gone through, it's gone up. If I see a lack of interaction, I, you know, remove them or I ask, hey, is there anything else I can do for you? Um, so, and, and that's just me. Now, when it comes to the social media side of it, I tell my, my son, he was like, daddy, you, you stay right around like on IG. I stay right, right around 2,400 people. It, it just never fails. I only have 2,400, uh, you know, connections or followers on IG. Um, but that is because of I will come in and I'm quick. If I don't like something and if I don't like a message that someone is having, or especially now in this season, between the pandemic and the elections, I have no regrets about removing someone and then they get in their feelings and they'll remove themselves. But I just know that I don't need that influence that they're going to have. But influence works two ways, right? We always think that we want to be the influencer, but we're also being influenced by everything we see, everything we hear, everything we do, or, or, or that people do to us. Um, yeah. and, and so that's one. So I'm quick to, I built it up. I know initially my focus was on, let me get to 10,000. Let me get to 10,000. And then I was thinking, oh, what's the point of me having 10,000 people that I don't know, like, or trust, or that don't know or like me, right? And, and so, swipe up. <laughs> right? And, and so That's that, it. <laughs> that was one of the things that, um, you know, Melinda just said, I think that we forget what, what business, what industry we're in. Okay, what's our purpose? Because if we're selling you know, socks, then yes, we need a million clicks and we know the funnel, right? Because I, we have heard so much about the click funnels and the process that we think that we have to have the ratios. And I know, now the, I'm not talking about conversion ratios, okay? Um, but we think we have to have the rate, let me get 10 million and let me do this and let me get this. Um, but, but then I started saying, no, that's not me. That's counterintuitive. That's against everything that I built as a man, as a husband, as a dad. And for me to have integrity, I have to say, okay, let me take my connections deeper, right? So uh, of the 2,400, you know, that I have, I probably met you or seen you at some point, whether it was at a convention or you came to one of my classes or I saw you somewhere and there's a connection there. Um, and then the same thing on like, for me, my biggest connection database is on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where most of my business connections and my business and referrals come from because that meets, that matches my personality, right? It matches, mm -hmm. you know, the people who are there, they're not going to be giving, well, what problem can I help you solve? When I post that question on LinkedIn, I'm not getting uh, sleeping. I, I snore. Can you help? <laughs> I, I'm not getting those types of responses. Uh, but then also, I know what I'm going to tolerate and what I'm not going to. I love that. I, I actually reduced the amount of followers too, because I want to be trying to engage as much as I can with the people that I'm trying to build a relationship with or continue a relationship with, right? Like we were saying uh, in the beginning, on, uh, online to uh, offline or offline to online. So that's one way I did it is like, I can't have so much like, you know, Direct crap in the, in the thread or in the feed and like trying to make a point to, to engage with what I see because that's the point of it. So, Re really quickly, Melinda, let, let me just give everyone a tip, something that I've used because we're talking about um, profitability uh, of influence, right? So how can we make our influence more profitable? It means that we need to have a greater influence. <laughs> and how do we do that? It goes by strengthening and deepening connections and ties. Uh, and so I'm going to ask each of you a question and answer it quietly to yourself. And then today and this weekend, if you do the one thing that I'm going to ask you to do, you're going to see your influence increase dramatically. On Facebook and Instagram or even LinkedIn, ask yourself, when was the last time you clicked the about section on Facebook to find out more about the person? Or when was the last time you clicked on their profile on IG? It's not something that we do. 
right? We look at the photos, we say, huh, we like it, right? But on, on Facebook, if you want to have greater influence on someone, instead of just looking at the photos, go to their profile and then click about. It's a wealth of free information. They've told us which university they went to. They're talking about their family, which other connections they have, and we just glean over it. So what I would ask us to do in the about section or in the profile section of IG, just grab one nugget and then send a message to them talking about something. Like right now, if someone went to Ohio State University, the Ohio State University, and, and I see that in their about section, I would ask them, you know, what's happening with or, or how are, is Ohio State going to be reopening with school? Right, because what, what do we know right now? Right, or if it's something about sports, if we just find one tie, because these are the things that we aren't getting. When was the last time someone asked you about something? Because now remember we said, instead of looking at it through our point of view, let's look at it through theirs. When was the last time someone asked you about something in your about section or your bio or your um, profile that you hadn't just readily shared? It never, ever, ever happens because we, are operating at a service level, surface level, level, right? So what I would challenge you all to do is find someone that you really want to increase your influence with. Maybe it's an outstanding prospect or a client that you're already working with, especially for us agents. If we have clients or customers that we're working with right now, go in, look, do some spying and some research and say, okay, well, <clears throat> I see they're doing this, this, and this, or they went here. Find out. Um, we have this tool. We have so many tools to our, our um, disposal that we just aren't using because we get stuck only on the real estate. You know, if, you're, if you have a buyer consultation or a marketing consultation with a seller, and if the first thing you do is start looking at comps or relevant properties or to see what's available, I think that's a bad first step because you're thinking that based off of a conversation or an interaction, you're going to go and immediately start thinking about transactions, transactional. For me, if I meet with someone. So when I found out that Anthony, that I was going to be on the show, what did I do? The first thing I do, I find out everything I can about Anthony, right? And so that's going to be the same thing that I would ask you all to, uh, Anthony, like, oh my God, I hope you didn't. No, you, you know, it's funny because you're the first, you're the first person that actually friended me. And that's part of our, you know, our entire process of uh, when you're signing up, because I'm always looking for them to try to tag them when we go live on Facebook and there's always an issue. So I admire you for following the instructions and yeah, we saw But he that. probably did that without. He probably did that on his own anyway. <laughs> but, but, but see, this is why it's so easy for us, for everyone who's watching this or who's on right now, that's why it's easy for us to stand out. You don't have to be amazing, right? And, and you all are amazing individuals, but we don't have to go out and do something that's earth shattering. We just have to go out and do the little small things that are going to make an impact to the other side, to the other person. Go through, and when you have a client, go look them up. Send them a friend request. Oh, like We just aren't doing it. So if you say, well, I'm already at 5,000, well, unfriend your mom for a day or do something, <laughs> right? You got to figure something out so that this person can know that it's not just transactional. Um, I think that like I deal with a lot of military relocation of clients who are coming uh, down here to, to, to SOCOM. Uh, and what I'm doing, the first thing is I'm finding out everything I can about their kids, about their pets, what they like, what they don't like. Remember, we talked about the experience, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm coming in, making sure that during our initial conversation or consultation, I'm asking a question. One of my clients just uh, found a rental because we, he had to move so quickly that we didn't have time to get him into a purchase. So we did a, a short-term rental and I'm saying, okay, well, how much yard does Bella need? And he's like, how do you know about Bella? I'm like, well, it's my job to know about your family. You've had Bella for 14 years, right? <laughs> so if you've had Bella for 14 years, how can I not know that she's important? Like a, a little small miniature schnauzer, right? How, how can I not think that it's important enough for me to make note of? And did I have to go through and ask he or his wife for that information? No, I didn't. They're so they're the platform on Facebook is public, so I can go on. I look, I get all the information, and then he was like, "Man, you know what? The kids are really gonna they're gonna be really glad that you're thinking about Bella." It's gonna, because I'm like, "Yeah," because I don't want you know his daughter. I don't want her to have to walk a long way to walk the dog. Well, how do you know she walks? Because that's all that's all the post, right? 
And so now my influence with him and his family has increased. And now let's talk about profitability. What does that mean? That means that when he started, even before he started the move, he's tagging me on all of the social media. Hey, you won't believe what Neil did. He sent a care package to them up in Pensacola before they came down here. I found out their address. So I sent a care package to them to prepare them for their move. Neil, what kind of care package are you sending to them? I'm sending them, they're coming down here. They're going to need mask because this is as we're doing in COVID, right? So I'm sending them mask. I'm sending them sunblock. They have their, their daughter is five years old. So I'm sending her the, 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 the typical beach pail with the, with the uh, shovel, right? Beach towels, things like this. Because in there I say, I know when you move, you want to get to the beach soon, but you, your, your, your towels might be packed, right? You know, so little things like this create that experience. And now when they take photos and they're tagging them on IG and Facebook, guess who they're tagging in the photo, right? So every time their five-year-old daughter is making her little sandcastle with this little bucket that I got from Five Below, they're tagging me in it. And then I'm like, oh, my pleasure, right? I'm glad that you guys can enjoy. And then their friends are asking, well, do you have, like, are you guys moved in yet? Do you guys, no, well, Neil's, our, our agent is taking care of that. We haven't gotten in yet. Oh, well, who is your agent? Well, he's tagged in the post, right? And so- Now there's social that's proof, we, right? That's there's actually social, social proof. proof. Um, that one of the, some, I don't remember where it was. They said like the best uh, social media post is somebody else's that's tagging you, yep. <laughs> right? But, but because, uh, because then, because then your, their friends, their circle are seeing you. Instead of you pulling them into your world, we want them to pull us in to theirs. Exactly. Because, you know, we all, we all hate the idea of the friend who's a real estate agent. Right. We hate that. <laughs> oh, well, are you going to listen? I, well, no, I have a friend who's a realtor. I have a friend who has a license. Why don't instead, why don't we become that friend who's a real estate agent? Right. Like we don't think about that. Like, why don't you become so friendly with people that they say, well, I have a friend who's a real estate agent. You're that and, friend, right? And you're the friend. Like, instead, we would just rather, well, I'm just going to be professional. I don't want to come over here and move into mm -hmm. their circle. Uh, and, and so we, we flip that on the head and say, okay, how can I get you to know me and like me first? And then when it comes time to making these, these life-changing decisions, then you'll trust me to do so. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're running out of time, but I don't, I want to touch on the coaching because this is like a special thing for me. Um, you said you have several coaches, mm -hmm. some of the best. I want to know what's your experience with coaching right now? Do you always, are you always coaching? Do you take breaks? Um, you know, I'm just curious <laughs> what, what you, what, how you, how you do that. I'm, I'm always being coached by someone, uh, because what, what I do know is, uh, I, you say, do I take breaks? I don't think that on this journey, there is a time to take a break. Uh, and, and now do I believe that we need to rest, but I'm always being coached. I'm being coached. And I, like I have a number of coaches and some are business coaches, some are personal coaches. Uh, some are real estate specific. Some are outside. Like some of my best ideas from my coaches have come from one of my coaches and mentors that I have that does not work, does not typically work with real estate agents. Right. And, and here's why, because one of, in my circle, one of my friends was like, Neil, I think you need to meet this person and possibly coach with them because their ideas are none that any of the agents in your area are going to have. Uh, and so that's when I'm like, okay, well, how can I take, because think about this, what's working, what, what has been working for a long time in other industries, we're just oblivious to. We just don't know that these are some of the best practices for great salespeople because they're not selling real estate, right? Yeah. We don't think about those yeah. people who have been selling media space to major corporations. But why would I care? And so one of my coaches does a lot with um, individuals who sell ad space to you know, companies. Why would I care? Why, why do I need, what can I learn for someone who is in the telecommunication sales? Well, most of the time, the people that they're talking to are very powerful individuals and they make decisions based on the long term, right? What impact is going to have. If I can learn that, and if I can learn, you know, get, gain some tips and, and maybe glean some ideas from them, then when I start talking to luxury buyers and sellers and in that affluent marketplace, right? 
I could say, okay, well, this is how a business owner, this is the way a CEO thinks, this is what they're looking for um, when it comes to service or experience. It's not real estate. They're not hiring me just because of real estate because they can go anywhere. They could find someone who doesn't do real estate to help them. Um, what they do want, they want someone who identifies with them. Um, so always, like, I am a big believer in coaching. Uh, I, I believe that everyone should have some type of coach, uh, even if it's informal, right? I mean, there's free coaching that's available. Um, I, I just believe that you have to have someone that you're accountable to, but then also someone who can pull you through. Um, and, and now my, my, my position on coaching, it does not have to be someone who has done what you're trying to do. So everyone says, you know, well, I only want a coach who's been able to do it, who I find, find someone who's successful at what they do. And if coaching is what they do, and then the way you're going to, our, our difference, um, our, our differentiating uh, decision maker is going to be their social proof. If they don't have social proof of what they've been able to deliver, then you find someone else. Right, we're not going to just take a coach at their own word. We're not going to say, oh, I'm the greatest coach. I can help you double your transactions, this, this, and this. Okay, well, can I see some video testimonials? And here's why I want to see video testimonials, because I know that written testimonials, Melinda can write a testimonial for herself as a 40-year-old man named Steve. Right? <laughs> Melinda did a fantastic job. I want to see the person. And even if they're an actor, make me believe it a little bit more. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so, so little things like that. But I do believe in the value of coaching. I believe that everyone should go ahead and and seek some type of coaching. I know that we're always saying, well, the cost, um, you know, cost versus investment, you know. Yeah, there's. Yeah. I mean, I, I do believe you pay for what you get. Yeah. Um, I've tried different types of coaching and the expensive one was the ones that, that really made an impact for me. And the, and it wasn't because of the price and like, oh, I better do it now because this one's expensive, but it was because the value that was brought, it was worth, it was actually worth it. And so I, I sometimes trouble finding, like I, I moved on from one program and I'm looking for others and I have a hard time sometimes finding something. Maybe I need to ask for videos. <laughs> For proof give me some proof i want some videos always, where's the source <laughs> source yeah so, so 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 melinda let me ask you you have a and on the idea of coaching right i would always say you have a money back guarantee right i have a teaching for tips you know mm -hmm. and, and so on coaching i would caution everyone if they don't believe in their system or their service so much that they're not going to let you try it for some point, even if it's a three day or one session, whatever it is, if they're not going to let you try it without paying first, I believe that you can find someone else who is willing to, that will be able to deliver at the, at the, the same quality or better. So the truly great ones, they know what they bring and say, well, hey, I don't just want a consultation, a free consultation. I need a session or a month or a week or something um, so that I can know what I'm getting. Uh, this is, for instance, you know, I was trying to use analogies. So you want me to just offer you a wedding ring without even the first date? Uh, like, come on, do you see why that would be a challenge? Um, mm -hmm. But I also think that it goes back to, are we willing to, for someone to say no and reject us and say, no, I'm not going to do this, right? I mean, we, we make our lives, uh, we, uh, most of our lives, we make our living um, negotiating. And I would just look at negotiating with a coach or, or, or with a system um, just as another form for practice when the lights are on in real estate and when negotiating is, is, is really, really a key. Very good point. Very good point. See, and Melinda's like, duly noted. Okay, then yeah. All right. <laughs> so much information, man. I mean, I got yeah. I all the stuff. Like, I'm just, I can honestly sit here and listen to you for hours. Right? I told you it was going to be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly could sit here. I, I just shut up and just take a note. Awesome. I, well, Dean.com. I got to check that out. Yes. So guys, we are past our time frame, <clears throat> but this was such a great, great conversation. I took lots of notes. Thank you so much, Neil, for, for blessing us with your knowledge and nuggets and always good information um, and great energy. Thank you everyone for joining us. If you're here live or if you're watching this later, we appreciate you. Anthony, thanks for another great show.
that's a wrap. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Bye, it. Bye, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Take care.